Hi, my name is Steve Bainbridge. I teach corporate law at UCLA. And I've got a new book coming out on February 9th entitled The Profit Motive, Defending Shareholder Value Maximization. As I said in the introduction, there are a lot of books out there uh, on the market that praise stakeholder theory, corporate social responsibility, ESG. They proclaim a new age in which big corporations and even little ones should embrace, and in fact are embracing, uh, environmental, social, and governance goals, uh, and putting aside the corporation's traditional focus on maximizing the value of the shares for the shareholders. And whether you've got putative, objective, academic books that are focused for professors, or you've got popular books that are aimed at corporate managers, the bottom line is really the same, which is that stakeholder capitalism is the right thing to do both morally and financially. This is not one of those books. Now, my motivation for writing the book uh, came back in 2019 when the Business Roundtable issued an updated statement of the corporate purpose. The Business Roundtable is a trade association made up of about 200 chief executive officers of large uh, corporations. And they lobby in Washington and conduct various educational activities and so on. Um, and since um, 1997, they have periodically issued uh, principles uh, of corporate governance. And those principles have endorsed since the very beginning, uh, the concept of shareholder primacy, more specifically the concept that it is the objective of the corporation to maximize the value of the stock for the benefit of the shareholders. And that when boards of directors and corporate executives uh, make decisions, that should be the norm that guides their decision-making. But in 2019, the Business Roundtable reversed that longstanding position and issued a new statement of corporate purpose designed to promote what they called an economy that served all Americans. Now, not all 200 odd Business Roundtable CEOs signed this document, but most of them did, about 180. And the document purportedly committed those executives to lead their companies in ways that are designed to benefit not just the shareholders, but also the other people who have a stake in the corporation. Employees spring to mind, customers, suppliers, creditors, debtors, communities in which the company does business. All of those folks admittedly have an important relationship with the company. And all of them have a stake in seeing the company do well. And according to the new business roundtable statement, it's the totality of concerns that make up the web of stakeholders that corporate executives and directors ought to be concerned with, not just the specific shareholder constituency. And so we see this in 1997, where the Business Roundtable said the purpose of the corporation is to generate economic returns to its owners, to 2019, where the Business Roundtable says, you know, we share a fundamental commitment to all of our stakeholders. And they committed to doing certain specific things, delivering value to customers, investing in employees, compensating them fairly, providing important benefits, health benefits and so on, fostering diversity and inclusion, dignity and respect, dealing fairly and ethically with suppliers, supporting the communities 
in which we work. And last, possibly not least, although possibly, generating long-term value for the shareholders uh, of the company. And they said that each of these stakeholder groups is an essential part of the corporation and that they were committing to develop value to all of them for the future success of their companies, the communities, and the country. Now, my book questions whether this was the right thing to do. And it also questions the extent to which the executives who signed this statement meant what they said. The book has two basic themes. First, that shareholder value maximization is the law. That is to say, uh, contrary to arguments made by uh, the late Lynn Stout, very prominent corporate law professor, who took essentially the opposite position on this issue from the one that I take, that we should keep teaching a case called Dodge versus Ford Motor Company. Law professors and law students will know this case. It's an extremely famous case that held that the primary purpose of the corporation is to make profits for the benefit of shareholders. And Lynn wrote an article many years ago entitled Why We Should Stop Teaching Dodge versus Ford Motor, basically claiming that Dodge was anodated, out of date, archaic, that the principle of shareholder value maximization had never been the law and was not now the law. And that's an important issue because corporations are creatures of the law. You can't form a corporation without complying with the corporation law of the state in which you're gonna create it. And you can't do anything really in the corporation that isn't authorized by that body of corporate law. And so the question of, well, what does corporate law say about the objective and purpose of the corporation is a really quite critical question. And in addition to Dodge versus Ford Motor, I argue that there are a host of other legal rules that either require or at least incentivize corporate executives, directors, managers, to put shareholder interests first. Not just require them to do so, but incentivize them to do so. And that becomes an important point. The second major theme of the book is that Dodge got it right. Shareholder value maximization ought to be the law. I argue in the book that neither economic theory, and by the way, I keep the economic theory at a level that an informed layperson is going to understand. I don't get into really complicated um, theoretical arguments. I try to focus this in a way that it will be accessible to a general audience. But neither theory nor what we know about the way the world works, the empirical evidence, neither of them support stakeholder capitalism. Rather, they support a rule of shareholder value maximization. Which raises the question, why did the business roundtable switch from its longstanding commitment to value maximization to stakeholder theory? And also raises the question of whether they were serious about it. Part one, the law consists of six chapters. Um, the Battle of River Rouge is the story of Dodge v. Ford Motor Company. I talk about the fight that arose between the Dodge brothers, who, of course, eventually formed 
the Dodge Motor Company that now is part of Fiat Chrysler, and how they went to court to battle. Then I talk about a case, uh, AP Smith Manufacturing versus Barlow, which dealt with the question of corporate philanthropy. Is it okay for corporations to make charitable contributions, even if there's no immediately obvious return on their money? Then I talk about a fun case, Schlensky versus Wrigley, which involved the Chicago Cubs. As you may know from baseball history, the Chicago Cubs were the last holdout that refused to play night baseball. And in the 1960s, a uh, young lawyer who owned some shares in the Cubs sued P.K. Wrigley, the owner of the Cubs, to argue that uh, P.K. Wrigley's refusal to install lights was costing the shareholders a lot of money. They were leaving money on the table. And he had a pretty strong case, but it didn't get very far. Then in chapter four, I take up Lynn Stout's arguments about why Dodge and its progeny were out of date, misguided, fundamentally not the law. And I explain why it is that I think we need to keep teaching Dodge because Dodge in fact was correctly decided. It was recognized at the time as stating a valid principle of law and it remains so today. And then I point out something which is that it's not just what the rule of law about corporate objective is. It's one thing to say the rule of law is that the objective of the corporation is to maximize shareholder value. But even if you changed that rule to say the objective of the corporation is treating all stakeholders well, there are a host of corporate law rules and practices that incentivize directors and managers to put shareholders first and to change the law to put stakeholder theory into action, you'd really have to change most of corporate law. And then I talk about a new development it's called the Benefit Corporation. And that's a very interesting development. It's a new type of business organization where you actually can put stakeholders' um, interests ahead of, or at least equal to, those of shareholders. I think it actually supports my arguments um, about how regular corporations should and do work. Um, and I think it's an interesting development and it's worth talking about. Now, in the interest of not holding you too long, I'm gonna focus in these uh, remarks on chapter four, why we should keep teaching Dodge versus Ford Motor Company. But let me say just a few words about the background of the case. In 1916, there about, Ford Motor Company was one of the most successful car companies in the world. And Henry Ford had introduced what was known as the assembly line, mass production. And as a result, assembly line working, as anybody who's ever worked in a factory knows, can be very boring, it can be dangerous, um, dehumanizing even in some cases. And as a result, Ford faced a labor relations problem, which was high absenteeism, people just not showing up, and high turnover. You'd get a worker trained and the worker would quit. And so Henry Ford wanted to do something about that. At the same time, Ford had another problem. He was outsourcing 
manufacture of significant parts of the cars to other companies. The Dodge Brothers, for example, owned uh, a company that made engines for Ford, as well as being shareholders uh, in Ford. And then there was the third problem of competition. Ford was, the company that is, was immensely profitable and was paying out huge dividends, distributions of profit to the shareholders. And the Dodge brothers were taking the dividends that they got on this Ford stock that they owned and putting that into developing their own competing car company. And so Ford wanted to deal with all of these problems. And what Ford did was to reduce the amount of dividends the company paid. He planned the construction of what became the River Rouge uh, factory complex, which would be an incredibly complex, vertically integrated uh, manufacturing site where basically raw materials would come in one end, they would be processed into tires and engines and bodies of cars, and finished cars would roll out the other end. This was going to be hugely expensive. It was going to be one of the largest, if not the largest, industrial sites ever built in uh, the United States until that time. Uh, and Ford was going to have to spend an enormous amount of money to make this happen. And so, as I say, he reduced the dividend and he started retaining earnings within the firm uh, in order to finance this project. And the Dodge brothers sued him and said, we want the court to do two things. First, we want the court to order Ford to reinstate the higher level of dividends. Secondly, they wanted an injunction to prevent Ford from building the River Rouge plant. Now, you wonder why they wanted that. There are going to be competitors, and they would be losing a customer to whom they were selling engines. So they had kind of iffy motives about this case. Now, Henry Ford, were, you know, the history suggests that Henry Ford was unwilling to be seen as a robber baron. Um, you know, the sort of cynical, make money at the expense of the world uh, businessman of the latter part of the 1800s and early 1900s. And so when the court said to Mr. Ford, well, Mr. Ford, why have you cut the dividend? Why are you building this hugely expensive factory complex? Ford didn't talk about, well, I want to make more money. What he talked about was the betterment of mankind. I'm going to provide more jobs at better wages that will produce more cars at lower prices. Now, actually, there was a rather cynical business plan behind everything Ford was doing. Number one, he did want to have more jobs at better wages for his workers. But what he really wanted was to provide wages that would discourage absenteeism and discourage turnover to pay people enough that they would be scared not to show up and they'd be scared to try and change their jobs. And as for cars, yes, he wanted to produce more cars at lower prices for the benefit of consumers, but also for the benefit of his market share. He was never a monopolist, but he had at that time the largest share of the car market and he wanted to increase that because he could see companies like General Motors and Dodge and so forth on the horizon as competitors. And he wanted to build up his market share as much as possible. 
So Ford didn't want to make what we might call the business case for what he was doing. There was a legitimate set of business reasons for doing everything he was up to. But what he wanted to do was to have it presented as, I'm a benefactor of mankind. And he actually said something to the effect of, I've made a lot of money for my shareholders and they ought to just shut up and take whatever I'm willing to give them. And the court said, no, the court said, look, Mr. Ford, the purpose of your business is not to better mankind. It is primarily to make a profit for the shareholders. And that's the line. That's the legal rule that says the objective of the corporation, the purpose of the corporation is shareholder value maximization. Now, Lynn Stout and others have made a lot of arguments against that proposition. They say that Dodge, uh, its statement about corporate purpose uh, was holding, not dicta. And in my book, The Profit Motive, I demonstrate uh, that the conclusion that Ford had abandoned shareholder value maximization was actually essential to the result. The court could not have reached the same result without concluding that Ford had abandoned shareholder value maximization and that that was a problem, which makes the court's statement of corporate purpose holding rather than dicta. Another argument Stout and others have made is that, you know, Dodge is an antiquated case. It's old, doesn't reflect modern realities. Well, you know, in the law, uh, we often accord greater respect to older decisions because they stood the test of time. If a rule was developed in England, in the common law in 1300, and it's still the rule today, we give a lot of respect to that rule precisely because that rule has proven that it can stand up to changing conditions. It stood the test of time. And so we accord respect to it. Dodge has stood the test of time. Over a hundred years later, it is still the law. Which means it's got something going for it. Third, they say that, well, there's no modern case law that supports Dodge. And that's simply not true. There is not a ton of case law on this point. And I suspect the reason for that is that it's generally accepted. Nobody really, other than some academics, disputes the proposition, until recently at least. Finally, they say, well, look, the most important state in corporate law is Delaware. And that's true. See, you form a corporation under state law, not federal. And when disputes arise as to, are we paying too much or too little of a dividend? What is the legal rule about the purpose of the corporation and so forth? You look to the law of the state of incorporation for guidance. This is a choice of law rule called the Internal Affairs Doctrine. So whichever state a company incorporated in, that state's law controls. Now, for various reasons, millions of corporations have chosen to incorporate in Delaware. Millions is a slight exaggeration, but only slight. And most importantly, among the largest corporations, the public corporations, the corporations whose name we all know, most of them are in Delaware. About half of the public corporations in the United States are incorporated in Delaware. And that goes up as they get bigger. If you look at the Fortune 500 companies, about two thirds of them are incorporated in Delaware. 
So that means for most of the most important corporations in the country, when you ask what is the legal rule, you're going to find the answer in Delaware corporate law. Well, what does Delaware corporate law say? It says Dodge is the law of Delaware. And you don't have to just take my word for it. Leo Strunk is now a lawyer with a prominent law firm called Wachtell Lipton. But before he uh, went to Wachtell, he was a vice chancellor in the Delaware Chancery Court. The Chancery Court is the specialized Delaware court that primarily hears corporate law cases. So he's a judge of a corporate law court. And then he was named the chancellor of the Chancery Court, which meant he was the head judge of the specialized corporate court. So he was recognized as being a particular expert in corporate law. And then he was promoted to be the chief justice of the Delaware Supreme Court. He is probably the most respected living corporate law jurist in the country, maybe in the world. I don't think I exaggerate when I say that. And in addition to his judicial writings, writing opinions and so forth, uh, Strine has been an active and prolific writer of law review articles, legal scholarship. In 2015, he wrote an article about what is the law of Delaware on the question of what is the purpose of a corporation? And Strine's answer was, well, it's Dodge. He says, look, in current corporate law scholarship, advocates for corporate social responsibility pretend. Now that is an extremely cruel world, word rather, excuse me. That's an extremely cruel word in our business. Because as scholars, those of us that teach and write about corporate law in law schools are supposed to be objective, not advocates for a position, but we objectively analyze what the law is and we go out and we tell people what the law is and then we try to explain why. And sometimes we'll say, we don't think that what the rules are, are right. We think we need to change these rules. And so we might advocate a change in the law. And that's all well and good. But what we're not supposed to do is to say, well, we went out and we looked at the law and we found that the law is stakeholder theory. When in fact, we know perfectly well that the law is shareholder value maximization. And that's what Strine is accusing the advocates of corporate social responsibility of doing. They pretend that directors do not have an obligation under Delaware law to make stockholder welfare the sole end, the only end, the only permissible objective of the corporation. That's not me. That's the most prominent corporate law jurist of our time. Talking about the law of his home state. Put bluntly, Dodge is still the law. Shareholder value maximization is still the law. In the first half of my book, defends that proposition in more detail uh, than I can possibly go into here. Okay, what about the second part of the book, the policy part? In the law, we sometimes talk about is and ought. What is the law? What ought the law to be? In the policy part of the book, I'm talking about the ought question. What should the law be? shareholder value maximization or stakeholder theory. And there's four chapters. The, what are the possible merits 
of the Business Roundtable's embrace of stakeholder capitalism. The Business Roundtable statement was full of pious platitudes, but very little in the way of explanation, very little in the way of saying, this is why we're changing our mind. And so I did that job for them. I thought long and hard about why they might change their mind, came up with some reasons, and I offer those reasons in the book and analyze them. And ultimately, I don't find any of them very persuasive. Then I look at the economic reality, the empirical evidence. Was there a business case for changing? Would business become more efficient, more profitable, uh, kinder to the environment, gentler on the planet if we embrace stakeholder capitalism? And here I argue that the answer to that is again, no. So then I ask, why did the Business Roundtable CEOs shift their position? And I'll talk about that in a minute. And finally, I conclude by saying, look, this is why they should have stayed the course. This is why you wanna have a system that's based on shareholder value maximization. Now, again, I don't have time today to go through all of the arguments that are made in detail in this part of the book. It's a couple hundred pages of what I think is some very readable stuff, but it's still a lot of detail and a very detailed argument. So I'm gonna focus on what I think is the core argument. Now, I've been writing about this stuff for a long time. I think I wrote my first article about corporate social responsibility back in 1992, I believe it was. And in much of the work I've done in this area, I come back over and over again to a simple hypothetical that I think makes the point uh, quite well. And <laughs> an Australian lawyer and corporate governance expert uh, who uh, Peter Tunjik uh, runs a blog called ondirectorship.com. And in a post on his blog, he referred to my hypothetical as the Bainbridge hypothetical. I have to say that I will take credit for coming up with the hypothetical. I can't necessarily take credit for all of the legal reasoning that the hypothetical leads to. This is an area where a lot of books have been written and a lot of articles have been written. I'm trying to respond to what we see on the ground today um, but in any event, what is the Bainbridge hypothetical? Well, take a company, Acme. And Acme's board of directors is considering uh, closing an obsolete plant. The board is advised that closing the plant will cost many long-time workers their jobs and be devastating to the community where the plant is located. The board's also notified or informed that closing the existing plant will benefit Acme shareholders. We're gonna save a lot of money and we can do that. We can use the money that we save to buy back some stock. And that'll be good for the shareholders. We're gonna build a new, more modern plant in another location and that'll benefit the workers that are hired at that plant. And it'll benefit the community where that plant's built. See, in talking about these sort of issues, we often focus exclusively on the people that will be hurt. We don't think about the fact that there are people who are going to benefit. Now, the question the Bainbridge hypothetical is intended to pose is, what should be the decision-making standard that directors use in deciding whether to close down the old plant and build the new one or deciding to keep the old plant open? So I think of it this way. Let's think about whose interests would be affected by the decision. 
Closing the plant, as we've said, would benefit the shareholders and the new employees. Keeping the old plant open would benefit the current employees and the current community. Now, in thinking about how the directors are gonna make that decision, the first thing to realize is that it's conceptually very difficult for decision makers to optimize, to maximize more than a single objective at the same time. Just conceptually, it's very difficult for anybody to say, okay, I wanna benefit shareholders, I wanna benefit employees, I wanna benefit consumers, I wanna benefit customers, I wanna benefit com uh, communities, because all of them have differing interests, competing interests in many instances, interlocking interests in many instances, so that you can't affect one without affecting another. And so just the basic question of trying to juggle multiple stakeholders, which is what stakeholder theory wants you to do. Stakeholder theory wants you to juggle all of these interests, interests and all of these constituencies to figure out what's the best thing for everybody. And just conceptually, that's extremely difficult. Moreover, in many situations, favoring stakeholders, making decisions that are less profitable is going to redound to everybody's disadvantage. Take a company like Apple. It could significantly improve the value it provides to consumers. And Apple, of course, is a very consumer-oriented company. Apple could significantly improve the value of its products to consumers by cutting prices. And that would probably lead to higher market share. It would certainly mean consumers would be happier. But in the long run, if Apple wants to continue increasing the quality of their products while holding prices down, it may eventually face financial difficulty. And that's gonna be bad for everybody. It's gonna be bad for Apple's shareholders because Apple will be less profitable There'll be less return on the stock. It's going to be bad for Apple's creditors because Apple may have trouble paying back loans and so forth. It's going to be bad for the employees. A company that gets into financial difficulty is going to have to lay off employees. And ultimately, it would be bad for the consumers because either prices will have to go up, Apple will go out of business, the quality of its products will fall. Something bad's going to happen to consumers too. So the first point to recognize is that stakeholder theory is asking directors basically to do something that's very, very difficult. But there's an even deeper problem, which is the potential for self-interest. Suppose we say to directors, directors, you are free to assess the interests of all of these different stakeholders, all the different constituencies of the corporation, and decide how best to balance all of these competing interests. Fine, all well and good. But here's the problem. Suppose for whatever reason, that the directors personally would be better off if the company keeps the old plan open. Well, the directors will say, okay, we've decided to keep the old plan open, not because it's in our selfish interest. No, 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 no. We're worried about employees and the current community. And we, are taking their interests into account. Conversely, 
suppose for whatever reason, it's in the director's interest. Decide with the shareholders. Decide with the new employees. It's in the director's self-interest to do that. And so it's in the director's interest to make the decision to close the plant. Giving directors freedom to choose between stakeholder constituencies simply empowers directors to find ways of camouflaging self-interested decisions. It allows the directors to figure out whose interests are aligned with theirs and then use those interests to justify doing what's best for the directors. And there's no justification for that. Companies, have, whatever reason companies exist, whatever the objective or the purpose of the company is, it is not to further the self-interest of the board of directors. Now, I build on that to say, okay, yes, directors sometimes would side with stakeholders sometimes would start, side with shareholders. And that's a conflict of interest problem. And that's a pervasive conflict of interest that stakeholder theory has no mechanism, none for solving. I'm gonna tell you a quick story. Um, one of the most prominent proponents of stakeholder theory in the business roundtable is Mark Benioff, the CEO, chairman of the board of Salesforce. Talks about ESG all the time, talks about employees all the time. A few months after Mark Benioff signed the business roundtable statement, Salesforce laid off a bunch of employees right before Christmas which doesn't seem all that stakeholder friendly to me. There's news today in the Wall Street Journal that Salesforce is gonna lay off another bunch of employees, which doesn't seem all that stakeholder friendly to me. And why is Salesforce doing that? To keep their stock price up. See, Mark Benioff is like a lot of these CEOs, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And I think what's going on here is what has been called greenwashing. To slather a coat of environmental and social concern on a business for good publicity. But in fact, when push comes to shove, the interests of the CEOs who sign the business roundtable statement and the interests of corporate directors and managers generally are aligned with those of the shareholders. And there's a bunch of reasons for that that I explore in the book. The most basic of which is directors are elected by shareholders. Directors who make employees, consumers, customers happy and shareholders unhappy are not going to get reelected. And that's even more true today than it used to be. Back in the 1970s, directors were pretty much free to do whatever they wanted because it was very rare for shareholders to object. And even if the shareholders object, it was very difficult for shareholders to vote directors out of office. These days, it's become much easier. And in fact, we have what are known as activist shareholders, whose ultimate weapon is to vote directors out of office. Salesforce it was also in the Wall Street Journal today that Elliott Management, a very large and powerful and frankly feared hedge fund, has bought in a stake in Salesforce because they think Salesforce needs to jack up its stock price. And 
Elliot is threatening to run what's known as a proxy contest, which is an election, to run a proxy contest to replace some of the current directors with people that it thinks will do a better job of maximizing shareholder value. So the first reason why people engage in greenwashing is that directors are elected by the shareholders. Secondly, director and top management team compensation typically needs approval by the shareholders. The people that pay these CEOs $20 million a year are not the stakeholders, they're the shareholders. Thirdly, director and top management compensation are typically linked to share performance in some way or another. Only shareholders can sue directors and managers who fail to run the corporation profitably. And that's because directors and officers owe fiduciary duties only to shareholders. The obligation to maximize shareholder value is what we call a fiduciary duty, a legal responsibility. And the directors and managers legal responsibilities are owned only to shareholders. which leads directors in most cases to align their interests with those of the shareholders. So I think a lot of what's going on with ESG is greenwashing, not real environmental social justice concern. And the conventional wisdom is that shareholder value maximization is going to kill the planet. Shareholder value maximization does not encourage directors and executives to treat employees and other stakeholders as mere automatons whose knowledge, expertise, and feelings are irrelevant. To the contrary, shareholder value maximization in most situations, and by most, I mean almost all, it encourages managers and directors to treat employees and other stakeholders with consideration, precisely because that is usually the best way of maximizing shareholder value. In other words, the difference between my approach and the approach of people like the Lynn Stout and her academic uh, supporters, is that I see ESG and corporate social responsibility as being a means to an end. It's a way of maximizing shareholder value that can be discarded in appropriate cases. They see it as an end in and of themselves. I think the Business Roundtable CEOs in their heart of hearts, think of it as a means to the end of shareholder value maximization too. Now, as I've said, it can be extremely difficult to maximize multiple goals simultaneously. Shareholder value maximization gives you a very simple metric. It essentially says, is your return on doing something going to be greater than what it costs? And that's easy to implement. You estimate, you predict what return you're going to get from building a new factory versus what you predict it's going to cost you. That's the decision Henry Ford made. What was it going to cost him to build the River Rouge plant? How much money did he think it was going to make? And he thought it would make a lot more. Contrast that 
to ESG. I pulled this graphic from an ESG website. There are 79 79 Maximans in that chart that we're asking CEOs to simultaneously maximize. Now, I don't know about you, but I have trouble simultaneously maximizing two or three goals at the same time. We're asking boards to do something that's a, very difficult, and B, not in their interest. So are boards doing it? Well, as I say, um, I think that a lot of what we are seeing is greenwashing. And I think there's a good bit of evidence for that. My friend, Harvard Law Professor Lucian Bebchuk and his co-authors did a study of 100 public corporation acquisitions. 100 cases where public corporations bought another company. Uh, and they focused on acquisitions that it were valued at more than a billion dollars. Not one of those merger agreements, acquisition agreements, not one contained protections for the company's employees or the environment. Including acquisitions by people who signed the business roundtable statement. When they went out and made acquisitions, they didn't pay any attention to those issues. Another study looked at the CEOs who signed the business roundtable statement and found that their companies had a higher incidence of federal regulatory compliance violations than those of CEOs who did not sign it. It's kind of odd. None of the firms whose CEOs signed the 2019 statement have changed their corporate governance guidelines to embrace stakeholder capitalism. Most companies post on their corporate governance website, their investor information website, a statement of their principles, their guidelines by which boards make decisions. And virtually all of them talk about returning value to the shareholders. Now, if the CEOs who signed the business roundtable had meant what it said, wouldn't they have gone back to those companies and asked the board of directors to change the company's guidelines? But they didn't. I mentioned CEO compensation. Of the uh, S&P 100 companies, studied by Lucian Bebchuk again, uh, only slightly over half of the Fortune 100, uh, S&P 100 rather companies, use ESG metrics at all in setting CEO pay. 62 of the 100 companies that Bebchuk and his co-authors studied were signatories of the 2019 Business Roundtable Statement. Almost half of those companies used no ESG-related metrics in setting CEO pay. So the CEO who signed the statement, none of their pay in half the cases was based on those sort of considerations they said they valued. Among companies where um, they do use ESG metrics, uh, they use them to compute bonuses. And bonuses only average a little over one fifth of CEO pay. So you're talking about a fairly small slice of the total CEO pay pie to which ESG considerations are relevant. And in deciding how big that bonus is going to be, 
90 some odd percent is based on stock performance. Only two to 3% is based on ESG related metrics. In other words, as I said, current CEO pay practices incentivize CEOs to favor shareholder interests over stakeholder interests. The vast bulk of their pay comes from performance-based elements such as bonuses and equity compensation. And the metrics that's used to evaluate CEO performance are almost entirely financial related to the stock price. So in basic, uh, in basic terms, we have to take the business roundtable statement with a grain of salt. It's said that lawyers think that the uh, plural of anecdotes is data, but anecdotes are useful case studies. And I wanna close by talking about a case study um, in the book of Etsy. Etsy's a great company. I shop there all the time. And it's a website where craftspeople can put up uh, their crafts for sale. Small businesses um, can put things up for sale. Um, and I get uh, supplies for my hobbies there all the time. My wife put me onto it. She has a number of hobbies that um, she can get things from Etsy from. Great company. Etsy started out as what's known as a B Corp. Um, that's essentially a company that has promised to take care of its stakeholders. And there's an outfit that will come and evaluate your company. And if they think that you really do take care of your stakeholders, uh, they will make you a certified B Corp. And Etsy qualified for that. Now, most certified B Corps have remained privately held, but Etsy went public, sold stock in an IPO. The S1, which is the form that the Securities and Exchange Commission makes you uh, prepare when you go public, stated that um, we're a certified B Corp and we intend to remain that way. Uh, we intend on using business as a force for good. And the then CEO of the company uh, expressed a strong commitment to stakeholder capitalism. Two years later, a hedge fund called Black and White Capital uh, disclosed that they had taken a 2% interest in equity precisely because they thought Etsy was undervalued because Etsy was focusing too much on stakeholders and not enough on shareholders. The next day, two more hedge funds, TPG Capital and Dragoneer, announced that they too had taken stakes and that they too had very similar plans. Now, this is a very common activist hedge fund playbook. Identify an undervalued company, evaluate the shareholder base, company's corporate governance to determine its vulnerability. And if the prospects for affecting change look good, buy a substantial stake in the target. Announce your stake, ask to meet with the target management. Tell them what changes you wanna make. If they decline to make the changes, then you threaten to run a proxy contest to elect directors who will make those changes. The incumbent managers often will go along. Um, they'll often capitulate somewhere along the process. But if they don't do so, then the activist investor will go to a proxy contest and seek to oust the incumbents and replace them with directors and managers who are more friendly to shareholder interests. It's been said that, quote, hedge fund activists want ordinary solvent companies 
to maximize profits for their shareholder owners, as opposed to benefiting communities, workers, and other stakeholders. And if that's true, boards that put stakeholder interests ahead of, or even on a par with those of shareholders are going to be vulnerable to shareholder activism. Because remember, only the shareholders get to elect the directors. Well, what should the board have done? Well, I can tell you what they did. A uh, rather snarky business commentator observed that Etsy flipped from being a crunchy hipster to Gordon Gecko in one afternoon. Viewers of a certain age will remember the original Oliver Stone movie, Wall Street, in which Michael Douglas portrays this corporate raider capitalist run amok named Gordon Gecko, whose famous line was, greed is good. And that's what Etsy became virtually overnight. What did Etsy's board do? Remember the CEO who was committed to stakeholder capitalism? He gets fired. Headcount reduced by 8%. Give up the B Corp certification. Hire a new CEO. What did the new CEO do? The new CEO focused on profit rather than social justice. And the stock price jumped. And everybody was happy except for Etsy's stakeholders. Now, although Etsy's story is a particularly high profile one that's gotten a lot of attention, it's hardly unusual. 2020 study found that activist hedge funds specifically target companies with higher levels of corporate social responsibility, which they regard as basically a waste of shareholder resources, and that their campaigns are often effective in reducing the company's commitment to corporate social responsibility. Companies that are targeted by activist hedge funds often abandon their existing plans and agree to demands that may not be what the directors and CEOs think is in the long run interests of the company's stakeholders as a whole. And as a result, many companies that started out with a strong focus on stakeholders found that they had to shift to a shareholder emphasis as they grew. And I think that's a good thing, which makes my book kind of unusual, but it's gotten some praise. Adrian Woolridge used to be the Schumpeter and Daha uh, columnist for The Economist magazine. He's one of the great writers on business issues uh, of our time, called it a brilliant defense of the principle at the heart of capitalist prosperity. Charles Elson, corporate governance expert and somebody who served on a lot of boards of directors, called it an extraordinary book that's highly accessible to the non-lawyer. And I'm grateful for their comments and those of Mark Hodak, who is an investor and talks about uh, that I make a convincing case for both parts of my story. As I say, the book will be out February 9th. I'll put a link to where you can pre-order the book, or if you're watching this February 10th or thereafter, you can order the book. I'll put a link down below. I hope you buy it. I hope you read it. I hope you're convinced. Thank you very much.